Hello and welcome to our Wednesday webinar from the International Centre for Sustainable Carbon. My name is Benedicta and I'm part of the communications team here. Our monthly webinars are based on our technical reports, which are available from our website, sustainable-carbon.org. Residents, member countries and employees of our sponsoring organisations can download our reports at no charge after a one-off registration on the website. The subject for today's webinar is the role of low emissions coal technologies in a net zero Asian future. Presented by Greg Castle. Over to you, Greg. Okay, thanks, Benedicta. So my presentation today covers a study carried out by the International Centre for Sustainable Carbon, working with the Coal Industry Advisory Board. Specifically, it covers the background in terms of the need, low emissions coal technologies, and the sectors where they will be applied. The challenge in Asia in terms of population growth, and GDP growth, urbanization and current reliance on coal. A look at China as an example of the case study countries, which also includes India, Indonesia and Vietnam as countries with different local drivers, together with Japan as an example of how regional cooperation can be used to achieve national goals. And finally, key messages and conclusions. Net zero targets are becoming increasingly widespread as reflected in the latest updates to the nationally determined contributions and recent government announcements. A number of countries have now committed to net zero emissions by 2050 to 2070, including Japan and China, with other countries such as Indonesia exploring opportunities to rapidly progress towards net zero emissions by 2060 or sooner. From an overall perspective, this will require an increase in the level of renewable energy sources, particularly solar and wind, together with a reduction in the use of fossil fuels. There will be regional variations, however, where in Asia, the means of achieving net zero emissions should be balanced with low costs, energy security, economic growth, population growth, and increasing urbanization. Asian countries reliant on coal will need low emissions coal technology for power generation, for foundation industries, for chemicals industries, and for hydrogen production, which plays into all sectors of power generation, industry buildings and transport. Carbon capture, utilization storage, together with biomass, waste, and low carbon fuels such as ammonia, co-fired with coal, will be key enabling technologies to help to achieve this. So looking at the particular technology of, of application. The first key enabling technology is CCUS. From a technical perspective, the various elements of the CCUS technology chain are in place for commercial deployment, indicating that the barriers to widespread large-scale deployment of CCUS are not technical. There are a total of 28 operational CCUS facilities globally relating to natural gas processing, power generation, and industrial applications, with the potential to store over 40 megatons of CO2 per year. In terms of the CO2 capture level, most studies in the past were based on typically 90% capture, but this level has increased to 95 to 98%, now with capture levels of 99.8% also shown to be achievable, based on recent testing by Mitsubishi Heavy Industries in Norway. This level of capture allows coal and natural gas to continue to be used in a net zero emissions future. The cost of CCUS, which is probably the single most important lever for wide scale rollout of the technology has reduced significantly with the current cost of capture of around 65 US dollars per ton of CO2 based on the Petronova plant in the USA. Recent project studies predict CO2 capture costs of around 43 to 45 US dollars per ton of CO2 removed within a proposed timescale for commencement of plant operations 
by 2024 to 28. North America will remain an important region, but Asia, and in particular China, should become a key focus for the rollout of commercial CCUS. The Jinji and Ordos CCUS projects at the 0.15 megatons of CO2 per year scale are examples of current demonstrations in China with plans including the, the Huaneng Green Gen IGCC Phase 3 planned at 1 to 2 megatons of CO2 per year by 2025, for example, and the Huaneng Multi Energy Project, which is under construction currently and which I will cover in more details later. According to a recent study by the International Monetary Fund, a carbon tax in Asia. So examples of needed CCUS policy support measures include more positive carbon price signals, which are needed to drive the growth in CCUS, whether this is effectively valued through carbon emitted emissions trading schemes or tax credits on the amount of CO2 stored. According to a recent study by the International Monetary Fund, a carbon tax in Asia would have to be around $75 per tonne of CO2 by 2030 for the region to be on a trajectory to limit global warming to 1.5 degrees C. The perceived risk of CCUS projects is a key factor in determining the availability of debt and equity finance, where key project risks need to be reduced or eliminated. Examples of these key risks are cross-chain risk, policy risk, and storage and liability risk. And a greater role of governments in taking on some of these risks for the earlier projects could help to alleviate this. Banks have a critical role to play in providing debt finance, which must increase significantly in order to achieve the necessary growth in the number of CCUS projects. Overall, as the CCUS industry matures, Risk reduction will make lower cost finance more available, which in turn reduces the cost of investments. Business models are also important, where one potential model incorporates the separation of the transport and storage infrastructure with government backed equity and debt funding using the regulated asset based model. Shared transport and storage networks can improve the economics of CCUS due to economies of scale an overall de-risking of storage liability and cross-chain risk. Heavy industries often exist in clusters close to local resources, power generation supply, and port or rail infrastructure. These industrial cost clusters can be supported by providing CO2 transport and storage network infrastructure, which multiple CO2 sources can access, often called the hub and cluster model. Co-firing is a second enabling technology and is increasing in Asia as a means to achieve reduced greenhouse gas emissions in the short to medium term as part of a longer term transition to net zero emissions. A number of Asian countries have good agricultural and forestry resources, including palm kernels and straw rice, with the latter of which is currently burned in the field and therefore represents an untapped energy resource. In Japan, the option to co-fire low emissions ammonia produced from fossil fuels with CCUS or from water electrolysis using electricity is being pursued as part of the country's national policies. Here, the target is to have around three megatons of ammonia per year co-fired at around 20% in coal power plant by 2030. In support of this, one Japanese power generator has started to utilize a small amount of ammonia at its Hekinen thermal power plant, with plans to increase this to 20% by 2030. Programs to develop ammonia burners and gas turbines for 20 and 50% co-fire, and ultimately 100% ammonia are under, underway. Returning to biomass, as direct co-firing in pulverized coal boilers has dominated the sector for the last 20 years, the technology is the most mature. It remains the most popular co-firing choice in countries such as Japan and South Korea. 
However, China prefers co-gasification in direct co-firing, as it is easier to measure the amount of biomass used in their processes. The first pilot test was carried out at Guajong Yingmen power plant, as shown here, with a 10.8 megawatt gasifier operational since 2013, where the CFB gasifier gasified rice straw. Asian countries, including Japan and Indonesia and China, have specific policy instruments in place or planned to support biomass co-firing. Power generation is the sector with the highest proportion of greenhouse gas emissions, emitting over eight gigatons of CO2 per year in Asia, almost half of the total CO2 emissions. In terms of low emissions coal technology, state-of-the-art ultra supercritical coal power plants currently achieve up to around 47% efficiency, equivalent to around 720 grams of CO2 per kilowatt, kilowatt hour. As this performance limit is largely set by steam temperatures achievable with advanced steels, efforts to go beyond have centered on developing an ultra super, ultra super critical plant based on nickel alloys. In the near term, however, smaller increases in steam temperature using new steels, such as marstenitic steels, together with advanced steam cycle designs, have the potential to raise efficiencies to approaching 50% or around 680 grams of CO2 per kilowatt hour. An alternative approach to pulverized coal combustion is based on coal gasification, which uses a combined steam and gas turbine cycle approach, offering efficiencies also around 50%, but with the additional potential benefits of fuel flexibility, generation of high value products from the syngas as well as power production output, and good compatibility with carbon capture using pre-capture physical absorption systems. The integration of fuel cell technology into IC, IGCC coal fire plant offers the potential to further increase the efficiency of low emissions coal technology through a triple cycle approach. In the long term, efficiencies over 60% have been projected for such power plant at the multi 100 megawatt size range, including CCUS. Additionally, supercritical CO2 cycles, such as the alum cycle, hold great potential for providing alternative power generation systems that can achieve higher plant efficiency and close to full carbon capture at lower costs. So overall, whilst efficiency should be increased by the adoption of low emissions coal technology, CCUS re remains a key technology to deliver very low emissions with coal-fired pl power plant. There are a number of options to deal with variability in terms of providing a, a flexible power system as the amount of variable renewable energy increases. These include flexibility on the supply side, energy storage, demand side response, and the design of the grid network. In the Asian context, there are a number of reasons why the case study countries will continue to use coal-fired power generation in the transition to net zero emissions, including the use of indigenous coal resources, enhancing national energy, energy security, and driving economic and social development. The flexible use of dispatchable coal-fired thermal power plant to support the increasing levels of variable renewable energy penetration is therefore a good approach for the region, providing grid frequency services and inherent spinning inertia through the large rotating machinery. Even when high levels in excess of 50 to 70% variable renewable energy are achieved in Asia, coal-fired power generation technology will remain key to ensure security of supply. Consequently, an increase in variable renewable generation capacity does not necessarily allow for significant closures of dispatchable plants, although the, co the coal plants will typically operate at lower capacity factors. A good example of how coal can support increasing variable renewable energy penetration in a way consistent with net zero emissions targets 
is the Hoaneng multi-energy project. This is a 10 gigawatt multi-energy power plant in Gansu province, China, which is being constructed currently and which is due to be operational by 2023. The power plant comprises 20 gigawatts of low emissions coal-based power generation using two one gigawatt ultra supercritical coal power generation units equipped partially with CCUS. And the re remaining eight gigawatts of power is derived from the renewable sources of wind and solar with around 10% of energy storage provided using battery based technologies. The CCUS element of the project is based on post capture technology using a proprietary third generation solvent which aims to reduce energy consumption to 2.2 to 2.3 gigajoules per tonne of CO2 in line with state-of-the-art solvent-based systems. It is targeted to capture 1.5 megatons of CO2 per year at a capture rate of 90 to 95 percent on an approximately 35 percent side stream of one of the one gigawatt USC systems. Site surveys have been completed for pipeline transportation of the CO2 and preliminary studies have been conducted for geological storage. There is also the potential to use a portion of the CO2 for enhanced oil recovery to support the, bar, the power plant business case in the near term. So overall, the Huaneng multi-energy project with its 20% of power from coal-based power generation with CCUS coupled with 80% power from variable re renewable energy is a good example of how coal can support the increased penetration of renewables in Asia to move towards net zero emissions with the coal power generation element providing dispatchable power to help maintain grid stability. Moving on to industrial applications. Global industry produces about eight gigatons of CO2 per year of direct emissions and around five gigatons per CO2 per year in Asia, with the cement, iron and steel and chemical sectors being responsible for around 70% of these. If indirect emissions are added, industry accounts for almost 40% of global man-made CO2 emissions. Demand for industrial products is forecast to continue to increase at least through to 2050. Almost two gigatons of CO2 per year of industrial emissions are a byproduct of chemical reactions within the production process. These process related emissions cannot be avoided using feasible production technologies. For example, 60 to 65% of emissions from cement production are created when calcium carbonate or the limestone is converted to calcium oxide or lime with these CO2 emissions produced as an inherent part of the cement manufacture process. China dominates the global production of cement, steel and ammonia making 50 to 60 percent of the global quantities and is a major producer of chemicals which is set to grow in the coming decades. A portfolio approach is therefore likely to be necessary to reduce CO2 emissions, including fuel switch to hydrogen, biomass and electricity via electrification for certain applications where available at competitive prices, improved energy efficiency, although this will not necessarily achieve zero, zero CO2 emissions by itself, and deployment of current best available and future innovative technologies including CCUS. So looking at the steel industry as a particular example, global steel production accounts for 2.9 gigatons of CO2 per year, with Asia accounting for 70% of this. China, India and Japan are the top three producers, with Vietnam growing at 12% in 2020 to become number 14. This steel is produced mainly by the blast furnace to basic oxygen furnace, the BF-BOF process, which accounts for some 70% of 
of total steel production and as high as 88% of production in China. It is a process in which iron ore is reduced and melted at temperatures of around 1200 degrees C. Coke, coal or natural gas are used as the reducing agents. And the resulting pig iron is then reacted with oxygen in a basic oxygen furnace to remove excess carbon content from the iron to generate liquid steel. The electric arc furnace accounts for most of the remaining 30% of production, with this process used to produce recycled steel and the remaining fraction of virgin steel. In this case, the electric arc furnace is typically fed with scrap steel to make recycled steel, supplemented by direct reduced iron, or DRI, where the syngas for this component is produced from coal or natural gas as the reducing agent. The electric arc furnace process emits around 0.4 tonnes of CO2 per tonne of steel compared with 1.8 to 1.7 tonnes of CO2 per tonne of steel from the BF, BOF process. So it is very likely that the electric arc furnace will increase, particularly in, in India, in the context of the study countries. Recycled steel in Asia is currently around 10%. But as, as the region develops, more scrap steel will become available, allowing the, the electric arc furnace to move towards 40% of steel production in Asia. There are a number of technology options to reduce emissions as shown in the bu bubble plot here. This shows technology readiness level of a particular technology against time, with the size of the bubble giving quality, a qualitative view of the potential impact of the technology in a net zero emissions context. As noted previously, secondary steel production from scrap steel will increase, requiring the increased use of DRI based on low emissions hydrogen, which can be, be produced by water electrolysis natural gas reforming with CCUS, or in the case of China, from coal gasification with CCUS. A range of technologies based on CCUS, including Hersana, Top Gas, Cost50 and Finex, will become commercially available in the 2025 to 2035 timescale and could be deployed in Asia to significantly decarbonize steel production whilst continuing to use coal. So to summarize the position of industrial applications, coal as a feedstock and for process heat dominates in China, accounting for 70% of its steel, 83% of cement, and 70% of, of aluminium, including the electricity to produce the aluminium, which is produced predominantly from fossil fuel sources. As noted already, there is some opportunities for fuel switch, to use or to co-fire biomass and hydrogen, some opportunities for electrification, particularly to increase the use of scrap steel and aluminium. But overall, given the clear dominance of coal in China, coal will continue to be key through the transition, with CCUS related technologies essential as a key route to decarbonize the industrial sector. The chemicals industry emits 1.1 gigatons of CO2 per year, making it equal third with the aluminium industry behind steel and cement sectors. Over 30% of these CO2 emissions are process related, meaning these will be difficult to reduce. China is the leading global producer of ammonia with 36% of the global 181 megatons per year market, an important producer of ethylene and methanol. Coal is the primary feedstock for the chemicals industry in China using gasification related technology. Gasification has a strong record in China, which is to some extent due to the use of coal as a strategic measure to avoid dependence on imported feedstocks and due to the relatively high natural gas prices in China. As shown in the table here, the chemical sector in China is set to grow with methanol 
as intermediate and for methanol to olefins, for plastic polymers and for the fuels production processes of coal to liquids and substitute natural gas are all growing in the near term. A portfolio approach of described, as described above for the foundation industries will therefore be needed to decarbonize this sector. Hydrogen is the final se sector assessed in this study and is the most versatile in that it can play into all sectors of power generation, industry, transport, and heating for buildings. Hydrogen is currently supplied almost entirely from fossil fuels, with coal accounting for around 27% of the hydrogen produced. In energy terms, the total annual hydrogen demand worldwide was 115 million tons of hydrogen per year in 2018. This hydrogen was produced in dedicated facilities, primarily local to the point of use and was used mainly for upgrading petroleum products in refinery applications and as a feedstock for ammonia production. The breakdown of the forecast use of hydrogen demand moving towards 2050 is shown in the plot here, with a total demand of perhaps as high as 70 exajoules or 650 megatons of hydrogen per year forecast. This hydrogen will be used primarily for industrial feedstocks and energy together with transportation, um, that will be hydrogen in pen fuel cells, heating and powering buildings, and power generation usage, including hydrogen buffering. The spread of hydrogen usage across these sectors is reasonably uniform, with significant quantities of hydrogen used in each. In terms of hydrogen production, the preferred method depends on local factors. In China, coal using gasification is a well-established technology and low emissions hydrogen production via gasification with CCUS is lower cost than hydrogen based on water electrolysis, typically by a factor of around three. With low carbon hydrogen produced by coal gasification with CCUS, costing typically between 1.6 US dollars per kilogram of hydrogen to around 2.4 US dollars per kilogram of hydrogen. So given the economic advantage of coal gasification and natural gas reforming with, with CCUS, it is likely that these will continue to build the lowest cost source of large scale hydrogen in the near to medium term. Looking at hydrogen emissions, the impact of the different hydrogen production methods is shown in the chart here, with estimated CO2 emissions per, per kilogram of hydrogen produced, where the CO2 impact of different hydrogen production technologies varies widely. The carbon intensity of hydrogen from unabated coal gasification is around 19 kilograms of CO2 per kilogram of hydrogen, which is around double the value of the carbon intensity from steam methane reforming of natural gas. However, when CCUS is added, this carbon intensity can be reduced to below three kilograms of CO2 per, per kilogram of hydrogen, based on 90% CO2 capture. And it can be essentially reduced to zero, zero um, emissions at higher capture, capture levels the kind of levels I mentioned earlier of around 99.8% capture. So this level of capture would make hydrogen production from coal compatible with the net zero Asian future. In comparison, hydrogen from water electrolysis using renewable, renewable electricity alone is also close to zero CO2 emissions. But where grid electricity is used, which of course contains a proportion of fossil fuel based power generation, emissions can be around 25 kilograms of CO2 per kilogram of hydrogen at the global um, average energy mix, i.e. higher than unabated coal. The outcome of this is that in terms of moving towards net zero emissions, the impact of using water electrolysis could be detrimental 
unless the water electrolysis process is used at low capacity factor to use solar renewable electricity or until renewables increase significantly in the Asian energy mix. So moving on now to the challenges specifically in Asia, I've looked at the, te the technologies and we'll now look at the challenge. The Asian population is growing and will continue to increase through the transition, peaking at around 5.3 billion people by 2050 to 2060. This will be an increasingly urban population with the fastest growing cities around the world in the next five years, almost all in Asia and Africa. The Asian region is at an inflection point where the majority of the population is now urban and will become increasingly so as we move towards 2050. This population growth will be matched by a growth in gross domestic product, as shown in the plot on the left-hand side, where the Asia-Pacific region is compared with Sub-Saharan Africa in terms of the share of global GDP. Asia has already grown from 13% of world GDP in 1960 to 33% in 2020, with the old Soviet model of protectionism of domestic economies giving way to greater openness and socialist capitalist models. Indeed, China, India, Indonesia and Vietnam are all set to leapfrog the richer nations in terms of GDP over the transition period to 2050. This growth will require increasing energy and infrastructure requiring more cement, steel, aluminium, and consumer products, with coal continuing, continuing to play a role to achieve this. This economic expansion has been fueled with affordable and relatively reliable fossil fuel power, mainly from coal use in China and India. In 2020, Nearly half of the total primary energy supplies in the Asia Pacific region came from coal, so the region is dependent on it. During the last 20 years, this has increased nearly threefold to three gigatons of oil equivalent. This is reflected in coal for power generation, as shown on the right hand plot, where coal accounts for almost 60% of the region's electricity increasing more than 3.5 times to almost 7,500 7, terawatt hours over the same 20 year period. Combined with the fossil fuels of coal, natural gas and oil, this has powered 70% of Asia's electri electricity needs in 2020. The dramatic increase in coal-fired power generation this century means that it is a young fleet. As shown in the upper plot, the majority of the fleet was built in the last 20 years. These young plants are unlikely to be phased out partway through their useful plant life, particularly as demand for power is still growing in the region. In terms of the coal plant technology, the lower figure shows that more than half of the coal power plant installed in the last 20 years has been supercritical and ultra supercritical, making these the technology of choice. There is still a significant amount of subcritical power plant on the system, which should be phased out or upgraded moving through the transition. As a consequence, Asia now accounts for more than half of global CO2 emissions from fossil fuels, accounting for some 17 gigatons of CO2 per year in 2018. China dominates this, with tons of CO2 per capita now well in excess of the global average, when four of the five case study countries of China, India, Japan and Indonesia, together with South Korea, being the highest emitters in the region. It seems clear that Asia, and in particular China, are fundamental to the overall global challenge 
of achieving net zero emissions by 2050 to 2060, and lower emissions coal technology will clearly be key to this. The case study countries assessed <clears throat> includes China, India, Vietnam and India, together with a look at Japan as an example of the potential for regional cooperation to achieve natural goals. Here, I mean that regions with good energy resources of solar and wind and fossil fuels, combined with potential CO2 stores, can produce low carbon fuels for use in areas of high power demand. These case studies are all covered in the uh, study report. So here I will just look at China as an example of the case study countries. China has the second largest economy and is almost a high economy country. Population will peak at 1.46 billion people, which will be 80% urban by 2050 up from the current 60%. China currently emits 12 gigatons of CO2 per year, aiming to reach peak emissions by 2030, and will continue the clean and efficient use of coal. Over half of China's 1,009 gigawatt coal fleet is supercritical or ultra supercritical, with some 85% 85, 85 of this being 20 years old or lower. It is pursuing co-firing, predominantly through co-gasification linked with pulverized coal power plant. And as I have shown earlier, China also dominates the steel, cement, and chemical sectors. For example, in 2020, China was the largest producer of steel at around 1,065 megatons per year. So it's a challenge to decarbonize. This graph shows China's emissions of CO2 and where they are heading. It illustrates the task of reaching net zero emissions compared with emissions in 2020, expected emissions in 2030, and the national, um, the national targets. The columns show that the degree of compliance with the emissions levels needed to limit the temperature rise to 1.5 degrees C, with green being on track or a role model, through to black as critically insufficient. And you can see that they are aiming for peak emissions by 2030, but the emissions trajectory after this remains fairly uncertain. To achieve carbon neutrality by 2060, electricity from net zero, zero sources would need to increase to over 15,000 terawatt hours, which would include renewables and CCUS fitted to roughly 850 gigawatts of coal capacity. So to, to summarize, I will draw out some of the key messages. A number of Asian countries have now committed to net zero emissions by 2050 to 2070, including China and Japan, with other countries such as Indonesia exploring opportunities to rapidly progress towards net zero emissions by 2060 or sooner. Increasing levels of renewable energy will be, be pursued but due to the region's dependence on coal for power generation, for industrial manufacture, and to produce hydrogen and ammonia, coal will continue to be used for the next 20 years and beyond. This is in part due to the, to, due to the relatively high cost of natural gas compared to coal in the region, the need to ensure security of energy supply, and to provide dispatchable power to help provide a stable power grid as the level of variable renewable energy increases. This must be achieved against the backdrop of achieving the lowest cost solution to net zero emissions as the region grows in terms of population, urbanization, and economic increasing wealth. There will be opportunities to co-fire coal with the region's significant agricultural and forestry wastes and to co-fire with low emissions hydrogen and ammonia to reduce emissions. But to achieve net zero emissions, particularly in the hard to abate industrial processes, such as cement, steel, 
aluminium and chemicals, carbon capture, utilization and storage will be a key technology. The CO2 could be stored permanently in local geological structures deep underground. For individual countries where this might not be possible, regional co cooperation, such as that between Australia and Japan, where the carbon is captured in one region and transported as hydrogen or ammonia to the region of demand is possible. In the short term, the CO2 could be used for enhanced oil recovery to be boost the economic business case for CCUS. And in the longer term, there will be opportunities to utilize a proportion of the CO2 as a carbon source for new value adding circular economy activities in the cement and chemicals manufacture sector. There are no technical barriers to the approach of making CCUS a key strategic part of the net zero emission solution for Asia. However, strong financial, regulatory and incentive regimes will be needed to achieve large scale rollout. So finally, I, I leave you with the overall message that technology is crucial for the, ro for the role of coal in the Asian transition. There are opportunities to co-fire and to switch fuels, but CCUS at large scale is key, particularly in the hard to abate industrial processes. Thank you all for listening. So I'll just take a look at some um, questions now. So I'm, I'm just opening up the, the questions window. So the first, the first question I see is how do you, what do you think about India? India plans to construct new coal power plant with CCUS from now on, like China. So yes, um, I mean India is the the, the second largest um, country in Asia in terms of population, in terms of uh, power demand, in terms of industrial manufacture. So everything I've spoke about for China um, applies equally to India. I think India, I, I spoke about steel manufacture. So India, I, I think will probably take a lead in electric arc furnace process. So using recycled um, steel um, to the, the kind of maximum capacity. But again, as, as with China, CCUS needs to be a key feature. So thank you for that question. Currently, I don't, I don't see any other um, questions. Um, ah, there's one more just appeared. Are the limitations in terms of cost benefits and efficiency, depending on the size of the CCUS applied? Not sure I fully understand that question, but um, I mean, it, as CCUS is is rolled out, as the um, as the amount of CCUS demonstrations increase, uh, and as we move towards commercialization, then I think the the cost of C of CCUS will reduce, and as the cost reduce, the risk will reduce, and therefore the amount of financing will increase. So this is all likely to drive down. Um, the cost of CCUS. In terms of scale, um, I mean, clearly CCUS is a technology that's that's applicable to um, to larger scale applications. So thinking about the the kind of cost of transportation and piping of CCUS, where hubs and clusters can be used. So if we can if we can bring together um, the the emitters and connect them into a, a common pipeline infrastructure that helps to share the cost of um, CCUS transportation 
and will therefore allow some of the, the relatively smaller emitters to also take part in that infrastructure and to help to decarbonize their, their particular industry. So I don't see any other questions right now, um, but if, if anyone um, wants to, to send in their questions, they'll, they'll all be recorded and I will attempt to respond to them um, offline later on. So thank you everyone. Uh, with that, I'll, I'll hand back to um, Benedicta to, to just close off. Thank you so much, Greg. Um, and all that's left for me to say is that the slides from this webinar will be available to download from the webinar page of our website shortly. And the next webinar from us will be on the 8th of December on prospects for coal in Eastern Europe. It will be presented by Dr. Stephen Mills. Thank you all for joining us today and goodbye. Thank you.